So uh, we just kind of went over this. Basically, the, the whole idea of this was to explain what's happening. What, what is compensation, right? Uh, what factors affect it, and how can we fight it? In an easy to understand manner, one that doesn't require a PhD. And at the end, the goal is to make it useful. Yeah. Right? So, and we I haven't seen that before, so I've studied a lot on it. So there's two things about condensation you really have to understand to know before you can really figure out what's going on. One of them makes sense to me, the other one doesn't. Okay. Yeah. But if you Google it, you'll find out it's true. Warm air holds more moisture than cold air. I think we all know it can be more humid on a okay. warm day, right? It, uh, yeah, I think you're right. But wet air is actually lighter than dry air. And that doesn't make sense to me intuitively. I so think it's, it's condensated already. It's in a water form. So, so it's wet, yeah, it's wet air. Separated. Water vapor is actually lighter than air. Okay. Which is why clouds are up, right? Okay. So, but you think about it, you know, air is nitrogen and oxygen. Okay. Water is hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. Hydrogen is lighter than nitrogen. Okay. So that's basically Avogadro's law in a, a okay. quick summation. But the other key to understanding condensation is to deal with it before the building's up. Once the building's up, your options or your your, your um, tools, or your remedies are not nearly as well. Okay. They're, I mean, much, much more reduced, much more costly, and usually not as effective. So, so we have three basic ways to fight condensation, okay? okay? Each of them is, is important. The first thing is keep moisture from getting in, okay. right? A lot of sites don't. Second thing is to move wet air out, okay. all right? And the third one is where you can cheat the system, okay. cheat Mother Nature, right? Okay. If you remember the old, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature here. It works for us. So, <laughs> okay, okay. Do the first one: keeping water from getting in. Site preparation. Ideally, you want to have a building in an elevated position mm -hmm. with good drainage. Sure. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, if you've got if you're pouring concrete or something inside, uh, make sure you're venting it out. Right. If you've got any sources of moisture going in. You've got space heaters or things going on inside. Those throw off a ton of moisture. Okay. So you have to account for that in the system that you're trying to put in place okay. to fight it, right? Mm -hmm. And really importantly, what people forget is, remember water vapor is lighter than air. We learned that, right? But there's also water vapor rising up to the ground. Okay. Okay. Right. So under your building, you know, you picture under the building, you picture that water vapor coming right up into the building and, and getting trapped, sure. just like a cloud, sure. right? That warm wet air rises up. Nighttime comes, the skin of the building gets cold, right? You've got warm weather inside, you know, it's lighter than the dry air. Rises up like a cloud and settles between the gables of the roof, right? So okay. picture that cloud right there, yeah. okay? okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> when that warm weather hits that cold surface, just like a glass of ice water on a hot day, when that warm weather hits the cold surface, it cools down, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Cold air doesn't hold as much moisture as warm air. We learned that too, right? So water literally falls out of suspension as condensation droplets until you go back below the dew point. Okay. okay, your dew point is yeah. a temperature difference, it's cold outside, warm inside, and a humidity level. The bigger the humidity level, the smaller the temperature difference it can handle before it starts to drip, like livestock and farming. Tons of moisture in there, yeah. right? Also, the other way around, basically, if you've got a huge temperature difference, like in Minnesota, really cold at night, really warm during the day, yeah. something like that, you need very little humidity before it starts to rain on the inside, right? So, but what you're doing here is we're looking at how we keep water from getting in. One of the things that happens is that water rises up through the gravel, through the concrete even, concrete's kind of like a sponge, that rises up and settles in that cloud, right? It, it adds to our big cloud between the gables. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so again, heaters do that, but uh, 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 vapor barrier under the floor helps a lot. Okay. Adequate drainage away from the building, if you can think about it. If you've got a site where you've got standing water after a rain, you need to think about drainage, sure. right? You need to think about some of these things. And think of other potential sources. There's a ton of other, I was going, there's a ton of other potential sources that are there. The filter, right? Whatever, you know, whatever you're using to fill. Is the ground still on? It's going, oh, yeah. Their system isn't working good for theirs. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> So uh, we're talking about- We're getting uh, more for our money over here. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking about, uh, we'll go back just a second so you can see. Well, I'm gonna jump, you don't have to, I'm gonna jump between the two because oh, okay. they're at the same time. So. All right, no worries. So basically in terms of the moisture, to the additional sources of moisture, 
things that we tried, fresh concrete, livestock, mm -hmm. um, the fill dirt. I've been at places where the guy said, no, the fill was dry. I asked him where he got it. He got it from the bottom of a pond. I can guarantee you the fill wasn't dry, <laughs> right? So you got all that that filters up in our cloud between the gables, right? Uh, if you've got a high groundwater table, something to consider when we're, sure. when we're looking at our system. The other thing is, I mean, I've been in places where you have a, a building here, you know, like almost a bowl-shaped slope down here, or up here, and then a catchment pond down there. All the rain, whenever it rained, all the rainwater went right underneath the, you know, through the gravel and everything else, and a lot of that rises up and, and settles in the building, right? So, wet hay, uh, green lumber, all different sources of, of moisture, just be aware of what they are, mm -hmm. right? When we're trying to deal with this, the, uh, the system. Then once we've tried to keep as much water out as we can, there's going to be water that gets in, okay? So then what we're trying to do is we're trying to move the wet air out. Okay, natural ventilation is pretty much what we all rely on for that, and almost none of us really understand. It's not the easiest thing in the world to come to grips with. That's where you get the PhD and the put you to sleep type thing when you look at it. But it basically uses wind and the temperature difference between inside and outside of the building to move the air up through and out of the building. Okay. So we all rely on this. It's basically what all of us are using in, in most of the buildings, unless we're using some type of mechanical ventilation. But this is there's a lot of things that affect this that we don't really think about. So if we look at it, wind is by far the stronger of the two. It can be up to nine times stronger than the temperature difference. Okay. So if you look on the left, that's the wing of an aircraft. So what basically happens is air flows up, up and over the wing faster than it does below. So that creates low pressure above the wing, which actually pulls or lifts mm -hmm. the airplane into the air, right? We've got the same thing happening in buildings if they're properly vented. Okay, so you've got wind going over the top from the eave to the ridge and back down to the, to the other side, right? That goes at a faster rate than the stuff that's filtering through the building. That creates lift. That lift pulls that warm wet air up and out. Okay, does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. But what can affect it? Location of buildings, prevailing winds, trees, mm -hmm. other things there, right? So if we, if we look at this here, if on that right side, if I put a, a bunch of trees mm -hmm. there, right? What's that done to my wing? Okay, yeah. what about if the wind isn't blowing from eave to ridge to eave? What if it's blowing from gable to gable? You got almost none, right? So all that nine times stronger stuff we have is down at zero, okay? If, uh, if I've got a building over there, anything else that's blocking it, a, a, a land feature, like a, a, a hill on that one side, all that's gonna uh, affect that lift that we're relying on, right? If you've ever looked at an airplane, if they were trying to stop, they raise the flaps on the one side and it basically makes it flatter, right? Or stops it. We're doing the same thing. That makes the plane drop down. That keeps the air from lifting us, lifting out. Okay, does that make sense? <clears throat> So, again, high ground's best if we can get it, but the building orientation, this doesn't make sense to me either. Because when I think about it, I think weather moves from west to east, right? Sometimes it does, yeah. yeah. Southwest to east, yeah. yeah. But generally speaking, it's said that if you can, make it so that your gables face east-west. Okay. So that means the prevailing winds actually are more normally uh, south-north, north-south. Okay, so that's the that's the doctrine. But the, the key is, and this is for your customers, you know, as uh, you know, the builders that you deal with, so they understand it as well. But one of the things with that is, if you understand that, and you then you see, okay, my building is going to face that way, or I'm in a valley and the wind doesn't move that way, right? Then you know you got to account for it in other ways. Does that make sense? Separation distance, you know, put move big stuff away if you can. Um, they say for buildings, at least 50 feet for silos and trees and 75 feet away for other buildings. So all this stuff is great, right? So all we have to do is keep our building up on a hill, right? <laughs> it's got to be facing exactly the right way for the wind to catch it, and you know, and, and have perfect drainage, no standing water or anything else. But the whole point of this is, you know, when you've got builders that are out there saying, do I need a vent and soffit or do I need, you know, some of these things? That, that everyone wants to have an easy, quick answer. The problem is, this is what we're dealing with. There's a lot of things that go into it that yeah. you have to know mm -hmm. to say. And even, I've been in buildings that have perfect, designed perfectly, 
but there are two buildings in Minnesota. One of them was this way, one of them this way. Identical buildings. Bennett's office, perfectly done. One rained like crazy inside. The other one, never. <laughs> so I got up in there and into a building and I put a, a vent meter on it, which is basically, it looks like this thing, but it's got a little fan in the middle. And it just tests, is, is air blowing through? The one, I didn't even have to use it. It was literally what little hair I had, so it, you know, was, was being blown, right? On the other one, nothing, dead. Come on in, join. <laughs> so the, the big thing was the prevailing wind, right? Just because it was a 90 degree angle, one of the winds was going cable to cable. On the other side, it was blowing east to ridge to east. So that created the lift and made the, you know, pulled that wet air out, where on the other side, it was just dead. And it's a perfectly designed building. It's just the way that you have to think that there's other things that affect it, right? So the temperature difference. This is the chimney effect. We actually probably spend more time worrying about this than we do about the others. So basically, warm wet air is less dense than cold air, okay? So it's lighter in effect. So that warm wet air has a tendency to rise up towards the, the ridge vent, right? And try and go out. And that pulls in the colder, drier air from the outside, okay? So there's a lot of things that affect that, okay? It's only as good as the smallest part. So you go ahead, don't worry. So uh, you, you drop this by a third, but that's all right. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that affect it. Basically, the um, your ventilation system that you've got is only as good as the smallest part. So I've seen people, I've seen guys with millions of dollars of farm equipment that have put in those expensive, uh, like metal 10 foot, um, uh, ridge vents, mm -hmm. you know, those things, really expensive. The whole way down the building, this is a huge building. All the way down, spent a ton of money. But he didn't want birds getting in, so he put closure strips in at the eaves. So his total ventilation system was zero. He had an output, but he had no input, mm -hmm. right? So in general, you want to make sure that your ventilation system is, you understand it, just having a you know a good ridge vent, no e vents or whatever, isn't going to work. You need to, they both need to match, okay. And if one's bigger, it's actually better for it to be at the e than the ridge, uh -huh. okay. That would be generally the case, I think. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there's other things that affect it. If we go back, or actually look in the bottom, the slope of the roof, uh -huh. okay, yeah. right. So the slope of the roof, it moves much faster if the slope is bigger. Okay, so that air, that that thing we're talking about, that warm wet air coming in and exit or exiting out, and the cold air coming in, if the slope is bigger, it's going to come in faster. That that process is going to be faster. If the slope's flatter, it's going to be slower. And any obstacles like purlins or anything that are going to slow it down. The other thing is, it also moves a lot better when the the side of the roof is smaller. So it doesn't work as well on a really wide building. Okay, so you've got water that's trying to come in and trying to work its way up, but it's called the chimney effect for a reason. We don't see many chimneys that are horizontal, right? So it needs to be as close to vertical as it can. Obviously that's wish, wishful thinking, we can't always do it, right? But at least that tells you what you're dealing with. So if we look at the picture here, these are just different things you're showing. You've got e vents and you've got ridge vents. You've got moisture basically coming in, you know, uh, warm wet air going out to the top and pulling in that that uh, cold, dry air from outside, and it's recirculating that way, right? So that's actually taking that big cloud of moisture that normally is lighter than the dry air, so it's between the gables, and it pulls that up and out, right? Hmm. It washes so that up. Drops down. Yeah, so the cold air comes so in, drops down that way. So again, there's two different things. The lift, this is the second half. This is the, the uh, chimney effect. So if you remember, the, the air is kind of going across and pulling it in other ways, too. So they're, we're using both of them. Right, we're using the temperature difference and the the, um, the wind. To try when you say temperature, we, we make sure you know that yeah, like the chimney effect is the warm and dry use or warm. Yeah, yeah. Basically, in the chimney effect in the building, it's the whole thing that makes it work is warm wet air is le is less dense than than cold dry air from the outside, okay. and it's a natural system. But it'll only come up and go out if the slope is decent. You know, if it's not a huge long run that it's trying to make, it doesn't move as fast. That one out of the air. So what can we do to control it? There's 
there's a lot of times, you know, all this stuff looks great, but like we said, all we have to do is make sure every building that we have is on top of a, <laughs> a hill with perfect drainage and, and it's a, you know, set up perfectly so the wind's going in the right direction across it. But in truth, we can't do much with that. What we can do is control, as far as uh, the, the natural ventilation, we can control the size and the placement of the vents. Okay, that's the one thing that we actually have some control over. And if you go to MWI website, they have calculations that you can look at and say, okay, I, they'll tell you how many air turns you need and they'll give you, you know, the, the type of the area of venting that you need for a specific building. You have to, the one thing I'm trying to make sure you understand though, is you have to take the other things into consideration too. All those other factors that we talked about are gonna go into it. But we can focus on, basically with this, if you think about it, the bigger the slope, the better, right? So ideally, we'd want the eave vent to be as low as we can get, and the ridge vent right there, because that creates an, um, you know, more of a vertical slope as opposed to more of a horizontal, right? So where, the, where those go and how big they are, you, want the, you generally want the eave vents to be at least half as big as the ridge vent to get to it, right? What a lot of people do is they just leave the closure strips out on an egg panel type thing, that's only one and a half square inches of vent space per linear foot of, of uh, roof. That's not a lot. And you can do the calculation, you can get, like I said, you can go to MWI or anyone else, they've got papers that show you calculations, you can do that kind of stuff. Um, and if it's a screen uh, uh, opening, you need to add 25% to that. But this is the one thing you can do, where you, where you place it and how you place it, right, is how big they are. Uh, is one thing that you can actually do to try and help fight, use the natural ventilation to your advantage, right? You can't do much with a lot of the other stuff, but this you can. The other thing you can do is what we call cheating the system. There's ways that you can fool Mother Nature, right, or, or cheat Mother Nature to try and make sure that it's not raining on the inside. One thing that we can do is we can try and insulate to keep it from reaching the dew point. So we looked before at the, we talked in the beginning, we talked about warm air is lighter than dry air, right? Or, or warm air has more mo moisture than uh, cold air, and wet air is lighter than dry air. So we picture in a barn, nighttime comes, we've got warm, wet air, rises up and hits the roof. It cools down, as it cools down, can't hold as much moisture. That moisture falls out as condensation, drips down to the ground. With condensation, with uh, insulation, what we're trying to do is keep that temperature difference down. So when that warm, wet air rises up, instead of hitting a cold roof, it's not quite as cold on the vapor barrier, right? So it can handle more moisture before it starts to drip. The vapor barrier is just there to basic, well, I'm actually going ahead. But the other thing you can do is, thank heavens for us, that's what we do, is as roll formers, you can install a condensation control membrane and deliver it to the site so your builders have it already on. It's already taken care of. And what that basically does, it uses the um, natural weather cycles to handle it and go and drip a bit more. Okay. So it's cheating the system. You, in both cases, it's not going to rain when normally it would, right? So insulation vapor, we just talked about this uh, for, for a bit. The greater the difference in temperature from the inside to outside, the less humidity it can handle before it starts to drip. And vice versa, the more humidity, the less temperature difference it can handle before it starts to drip. So the insulation keeps the temperature down so it can handle more humidity before it drips. The vapor barrier is just there to keep the moisture from going up through the insulation, hitting the roof, and drip down in there. Okay. So, kind of, forgive me if I say drip stop, drip stop's what I know, but <laughs> basically, condensation control membranes work when nighttime comes, warm wet air rises up, hits that cold metal roof. As it cools down, Drip stop is actually like a sponge that's up there that catches the, the droplets as they fall out of suspension. And it holds it there until the sun comes back up and it burns back out into normal humidity. It's almost like a breathing, absorb and release type process. So when it holds more than a quart of water per 10 square feet, that is a ton of moisture. You think about an average building, you think about a quart of water every 12, uh, 10 feet of roof space, that's a lot of moisture. Basically what we say is if you have drip stop and, it, and you have dripping, you don't have a condensation problem, you've got a ventilation issue. You're not ventilating. Insulation, drip stop, you still have to have some ventilation that's eventually going to dry it out. Because you're going to add more and more and more moisture into that environment, right? And ventilation is kind of like wringing out the sponge. It's taking that warm wet air and it's, it's pulling it out. Because as we add more in, 
You know, if we, if there's, same thing if there's no ridge, if there's no way to get it out, it's just gonna get, that cloud's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Pretty much your whole issue with the Yeah. Does all that make sense so far? I'm sorry, you were. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, make it up for this. So, what are the advantages of the, those type of membranes to builders? Basically, you're cutting one step of the construction process out. The biggest advantage we've got is you cut, cut time and you cut money, okay? There's no more blown up with a slap tacker on a windy day trying to get you know, the, the insulation paper barrier tacked down. It arrives, you know, roll formers, you guys put it on, so for the builder, it arrives at the job site on end. He doesn't have to pay anybody to put it up, and that's usually about 10, uh, 15 to 25 cents a square foot, just labor costs to install that stuff. So that's the big savings in terms of money, but also time. If you've got a crew and you got half the time on the roof with, the, with that crew, you're gonna, that crew's gonna be able to do more jobs, right? So it's more money that way as well. So time is money. You can, you know, if anyone who's been up on a roof on a windy day trying to put down insulation, you know how much fun that is, right? I, it's like that big game of parachute, you know, it's just, <laughs> so, uh, now, okay, if, if it's too bad that you can't hold the seal, we can't help you. <laughs> but as long as you can hold the seal, we can, we can, it'll certainly help. It also, nobody's roof ever leaks, right? But if you do get a uh, roof leak and you have insulation and vapor bar barriers, you get what I call the above ground pool, right? It all drips down into the, the uh, vapor barrier and you get that, the pooling of water right there, right? With drips of condensation control membranes. You go into the building, you look up. If you don't have like a basketball size, slightly darker patch, you don't have a roof leak. And if you do, you know which screw it is. Otherwise, if you've ever been up on a roof trying to look at, you know, mechanically passing roof, trying to figure out which one didn't seat quite right, it's not the most fun thing in the world, right? So, another big deal is it's safer for the crew. Number one, half the time on the roof means half the chance of fire. Number two, you can see where you're stepping, right? As opposed to, you know where you're putting your feet as opposed to where you're. So it is a pretty big deal, and a lot of companies actually really care a lot about that. And also, it's something that you can count on. This is not something new. But we drip stop, I can't say for others, but drip stop, we do over 500 million square feet of this stuff every year. It's been in every climate condition in the world. We're in every continent except for Antarctica. Can't say that one. I don't see us ever going there. <laughs> but it's been there and it's been tried. So basically it's something that's been tried and tested. The advantages to building owners, it does help fight corrosion. The, ad the adhesive is rubber. So you end up rubber coating your steel, right? Okay. So, and most people think in livestock confinement that it's ammonia that's eating away at the, the steel. It's not, it's sulfuric acid. And it's not rocket science. If you read anything about safety for dealing with acid, the first thing is you gotta wear eye protection, right? The second thing is rubber gloves. Rubber is resistant to acid. So it does go a long way to help uh, prolonging the life of the hand, especially in livestock confinement. It is extremely durable. I'll, again, I'm, not talking about anybody else, drip stop in this. Basically, it is extremely hard to, to tear, to rip repair. You can take a screwdriver to it, ease to it, you know, steel tip pen to it. It basically, once it's on there, it's on there. Now, forklift versus drip stop, forklift is gonna win. <laughs> but for the most part, once it's on there, it's on there. Uh, no bird's nest in trouble. That's one of the things I love about this. It's not, you know, you can't take away at the insulation nest and, and get in there. It's, again, once it's on there, it can't really take it off. It does help with the, uh, the sound levels in the building. It, it helps with the uh, impact level, like rain noise, so it knocks out about 20% of that. And also the reflective acoustics, so the echo effect inside of the building, it helps about 20% with that as well. The only place I've really seen people care that much about it is equestrian horses, for example. Doesn't speak to horses as much, they like to have that, but people, people seem to like it. It's really easy to clean. You can pressure wash it, you can do whatever. Most people don't do anything with it. It's polyester and rubber. Basically, if you look at a leisure suit from the 70s, it looks the same today as it did back then. <laughs> you know, polyester is very, very durable and doesn't really, nothing happens to it. So, uh, we've had fire hoses taken to it. So you know, it's, it, it's pretty much maintenance free as far as that goes. So those are the big, the big advantages to building owners as far as that goes. I'm trying not to make too much of a sales pitch for Stuff here, so, but uh, and that's it. So there's probably enough time where you can go through the whole thing again if you <laughs> really wanted to. 
So uh, let me ask you a question. Did it make sense to you? It did. More now? Yeah, it did. Okay. And compared to what you've written, does it, does it, is, do you think you can find it useful when you're out there if you've got builders who are talking to you and have issues with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we do use it too. We do some yeah. postcard as well. So yeah, okay. I guess we, we do use it. Okay. The big thing mine been, you know, it's not cost effective as far as even with a little bit extra laying on it, it's still expensive. So probably the one thing that, that I remain is. As a builder? Really? Builders usually find it cheaper. Maybe I'd get it from the wrong source. No, well, if you think about it, okay, if you're paying, I don't know, a buck a linear foot for it, let's say, okay? If you're buying double bubble, you're paying what, like 20, 25 cents a linear foot? Thank you for letting us work. Oh, no problem, thank you. Uh, I buy my, I'm used to solar actually, it's a buck, 13 cents a foot. 13 cents a foot, okay, then that's Not linear foot, square foot. Square foot, okay. Yeah. So 13 cents a cents a you know. Yeah, so, yeah, you're right. In that case, if, and that's single bubble? It's similar to that. Okay. Yeah. In, in that case, mostly when we look at like two inch bottom back, people are paying 35, 30, 35 yeah. cents a square foot for it. Double bubble, most places around the country, people are paying 22, 25, in that area, 27. Um, yeah, if you're paying that much for it. it so you add 15 yeah, to 25 cents. Same price, so. Yeah, well, even with that, if, if, if it's 25 cents and you add, even on the minimum side, 15 cents a square foot for labor, right, you're at 40 cents as opposed to 33 cents. So it does end up being. Yeah. I, but, but and the other thing I was probably, but I kind of pushed back on it, like, well, you get just a little bit of insulation value. You do. As well. it's, not, it's not much. I mean, one of the, one of the great, I, I'm a huge fan of uh, reflective insulation. One of the issues that we have with it, though, is it's hard to install it the way that it's supposed to be installed. That's so true. Right? Because to get any R value out of the, or the reflective value out of the insulation, you need a gap. Right? It needs to have a sag between the roof and the, and oh, the aluminum. Oh, I see. Okay. Right? I see. If you think about it, like you buy an expensive piece of like pot, right? It's got an aluminum disc in the bottom. Right? It, it's a great conductor of, of uh, heat. But when you move it further apart, then it reflects it back, right? That's the whole idea. So you need it. You're saying it's right against it, it really doesn't it reflect doesn't do it. anything. It doesn't okay. do anything. It's a vapor barrier, though. So you're saying it wouldn't reflect back to the material, though, necessarily. If it's right against the No, you need a gap to, to work. Oh, these aren't my words. This is. This is I think I've heard that before. This is at one of the NFPA shows. The guy who's the guru on reflective insulation, I stayed afterwards and they were asking, you know, a builder saying, look, you know, I know you're supposed to have some type of a gap, but everybody, you know, they don't like the sag. They want it to be pulled tight, yeah. right? But if you pull it tight, it just locks all of your stuff I down. I, so, I, I, I mean, I've heard it, but I, I didn't believe it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so here's here's another one for you. So I don't know if you get involved in in sidewall insulation, um, new homes or whatever, but it, that's been an issue that I've been really concerned. I used to be a home builder. I quit that some years ago. Uh, had my uh, partner. Project manager, that's what um, But I have seen OSB rot on the side yeah. of, a, of a house. One experience I had on a personal level was um, we used fiberglass insulation. We used tight tape on the outside. And there must have been enough heat that went through that insulation to the wafer board. Took the tight tape, condensated on the inside. And on the north side, the north side, you have a problem with these things. They're literally rotting out the old street. Yeah, that can be con that can be condensation. Well, I'm sure that's what yeah. it is. One, the other thing is, though, as far as sources of moisture coming in there, you know, it's whatever moisture is in that gap or whatever comes into that gap, right? Right. There's nothing that is zero permeability except a solid layer of aluminum. So when we put vapor barriers or anything else, that's great. They're a good help. But there's nothing that is zero. So whatever's happening so you're saying it will go right through the drywall it will go it will yeah, yeah. I, I was suspicious of that because of the way it was acting yeah it it does i mean um now on walls it's, it's less common than it is in ceiling because remember and what you learn now right should say it's there's a reason that we only put drip stop in at the top right at the ceiling we don't put it on the wall reason being that warm air rises okay. think of that cloud between the roof right it makes sense yeah, yeah. so that should be the same thing inside of a house, but inside of a house, depending on what it is, there could be all, I mean, humans are great sources of moisture too, sure. right? I mean, cooking is a big source of moisture, showers, everything else, yeah. you know, so a lot of that depends. 
I would also wonder if anything dripped down from the attic as well. If there was anything dripping down from there. Like uh, one of the things that I've seen is people who vent the bathroom vents into the attic. Oh yeah. If you were shooting or something, so yes. You know, I can see that as well. <laughs> you put so, it all up in the attic. Yeah, you're basically just creating. Number one, it's all going to collect there anyway. And number two, you're adding more and more and more moisture, and it's going to do all the time. So. So one of the things that we have done, we quit using Kyme and went to a half inch uh, DPS hole. Yeah, closed cell. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's closed cell. You want to just close cell. You want closed cell. If you're trying to use it as a barrier, yeah. Okay. The foam will give you an R value number one, which Kyme can't. That'll help, right? But open cell foam is open as well, right? I mean, moisture can get moisture through. Moisture can get in the attic. Hmm. It's like styrofoam. Yeah. A lot of times, uh, some of that stuff has a, a reflective factor. As well. Yeah, that's what it is. And if it's a reflective factor and if it's aluminum, what you're getting is you're getting like a solid layer of aluminum for much. You're taking the cement off, right? And that's pretty much impermeable to moisture. Okay. So if you have reflective aluminum, so you're cutting it down to it. You don't have to. So I was thinking that there's actually you know, just reflected coating. It looks like aluminum, but not actually aluminum. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't know. It's yeah. like a plastic, whatever. Yeah, I think so. Whatever you've got is, you know, just because not, nothing is zero perm doesn't mean that there's not you right. know, barriers that help stop. You, you, we're really, you know, I joke about cheating the system or, or uh, fooling Mother Nature. Mother Nature always wins. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, you but always just have to account for that and what we do. So, and, and do the best that we can. And yeah. it's, it's the greed. So, what I want people to take, out, take a, uh, away from this is, you're a builder, so it's different for you because you see both sides of it. If you're a role former, builders come in and say, hey, I got a tenant's offer. You know, why didn't it work? Or, or you know, um, don't need bridge vent now. <laughs> okay, you know, then understand that, you know, be able to, to answer questions and know what's going on in your head. Because I've been out to job sites with builders and with, with role formers and other things where, you know, you, you take a look and you can figure it out. If you know the things that are just there, you can figure out what's going on to a pretty good degree. Okay. You know, and that was the whole idea of it, and, and trying to make people, <laughs> all these people, understand. So, but hopefully, if I help one guy, that's good. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry you didn't have your crowd, but what you had yeah. to say was good. It was, it was, uh, yeah, all the best ones I've taken. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm John. I'm Chris Davis. Nice to meet you, Chris. Nice to meet you. If you got any questions, I'll get your card just in case you need something. So, uh, do you uh, do you have any guys in Ohio that are using it? Like. Come here, Melanie, to run your stuff. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Sorry, I've used it, but yeah. I'm actually got a job coming up where we're using quite a bit of it. Okay, good. Yep, Lamar started with us ages and ages ago, so. Lamar is a good guy. Yep, he is. They do a good business. I would say. He's actually, so we do a little form of standing scene, but uh -huh. one of the reasons that I probably will not do a flat panel or a three foot egg panel is because. He has got the market, he's doing so well that I'm two hours away from him and he, he serves as well. A lot of the a lot of the stuff, there's economies of scale. If you're running through, you're not stop, starting to stop wanting everything else, and your ability to buy steel right now. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, I mean that's a big deal. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So. Is that the, is that the yeah, stuff right here? That's what it is, it's a fuel stick. It's a giant sticker that goes on the steel. So do you ever put that on, would it be any reason to use it on? We do a lot in standing scene for self-storage. So self-storage self where they're using like the ultra depth type of panel. So what, what, as far as that room, that's your rule for me, you just have to readjust the thing? Or? About eight out of 10 times you don't, or we find a, a happy medium between. Okay. But there's no way to say, I got a Bradbury or I've got an ASC or sure. I've got new tooling or old tooling. I've put in over 400 of these lines and there, there's no rhyme or reason to which one is the unlucky guy. You okay. know what I mean? I see. So, <laughs> so most times it does actually work. You just most times you don't have to. Okay. But sometimes we'll get on a run where three of them will have to adjust. You know, okay. and then the next five that go through, we, you know. Well, the ideal that you wouldn't have to adjust it because you, you, you know, go from one to the next. Or, one. Okay. or if you don't yeah. want to miss one. Yeah. So, yeah, ideally you don't have to adjust. I mean, that's why we try to find a happy medium. The other thing we try and do is we try, we try and let people see that, basically. Uh, and, and we get it real close, but 
then adjust it as you're running jobs. So you're not losing money and losing seals or, you know, it can be a, a cost good experience to run a whole bunch of things unless you want to get it just perfect. For the most part, I'm, you know, if you're talking about Snapwatch channel, it's going to be fine. Okay. It's, what you're usually adjusting for is we call it smile effect for the total output. Uh, okay. Right? And all we're trying to do is flatten it out. Okay. So especially the CNC and Snapbox, that's not a good idea. So you would just have a machine that would roll, uh, an unroller or whatever yeah. that would just put on the bottom side of your metal as you're going out of it? The There's an applicator that we supply free of charge. Basically, it's three axles. The bottom one holds the roll of our material, right? It goes to that. The second one peels this plastic backer off and collects it. Okay. This is a peeling stick. I see, that's how it's put up. Yep. The third one brings it back to the side up. It roll forms right with the rest of the panel. So, and, then and, then, the and it goes through two pinch rollers and it runs right through the machine and rolls right through the guys. That's why, that's how it can get there. So, are you, what, 24 inch? Our, ours is 16 inch panel. 16, okay. Start out with 20 inch four. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, that's generally what you're looking well, for. Well, I'll keep that in mind if we have something. Yeah. So, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you.